But we're, we're talking about human biology. And when you hear the word biology and, and bios, I want you to understand that bios means life. So biology literally translated means the, the study of life. What, what does it mean for something to be living? Well, we've got all these definitions of what it means to be living. And one of those criteria for something to be living is that it contains DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. Now, I have twin 18-year-old boys, identical twins. Yeah, you need to, you need to feel for me, right. They, they love to ask me challenging, difficult questions. Maybe challenging, difficult, or just weird because their brains are all over the place. So they like asking me questions, are viruses living? Like the flu virus. Is the flu virus alive? What would you say? Is the flu virus alive? I hear yeah. I mean, we, we think of it as a living entity, evil entity that attacks us, infects our body, it destroys things, it makes us feel like near death. But when you look at these criteria, many of the flu viruses do not contain DNA. Uh, another virus, HIV. Are you familiar with HIV virus? What is that associated with? HIV is associated with AIDS. HIV is what's called a retrovirus because instead of DNA as its genome, its composition, it has RNA. So in fact, with our first definition here, HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, cannot be considered living. Now, we made the rules. We can change the rules, but this is how they exist right now. Now, DNA in our body and for other organisms that are alive, DNA is our genetic code. And what DNA is used for is to make a copy of that genetic code into a similar nucleic acid strand called RNA, DNA is inside a structure we call the nucleus. RNA moves into the cytoplasm. And it's in the cytoplasm that that code is used to produce a protein. Proteins are basically the tools with which the cell does everything it needs to do. So without DNA, we can't have RNA. Without RNA, we couldn't make protein. So that's where DNA comes into play. Are viruses alive? Let's go back to our question. Are viruses alive? Look at criteria number two. All living things are composed of at least one cell. Is a virus composed of at least one cell? Everybody shake their head no. Viruses aren't, aren't cells. They're not composed of cells. They don't have DNA. They don't have cells. So do you see how by this criteria that is strictly defined, some things that have some of the qualities of living entities really don't fall within this category. Number three, reproduction. Viruses replicate themselves, basically make millions and millions of copies of themselves, but when we talk about reproduction, we're talking about inheritable material that's passed on. Sometimes it, it is recombined. And that then leads to the development of a new individual. And in many instances, this recombination event that we're going to get to at the end of the semester creates an individual with a DNA sequence code, a genome, which is the total of all your DNA, that has never existed before in the history of the universe. That's kind of cool. You or no one like you has ever existed before in the billions of years of the existence of the universe. It's kind of mind-blowing. So, reproduction. Now, here's where we really start to distinguish from viruses. Many viruses take over a host and basically turn that host cell into a virus factory. But living things are able to engage in metabolism. They obtain these raw materials from their surroundings. And they use that raw material to produce energy that then sustains all of the cells, whether it's one or ten trillion cells that compose that individual for growth, 
for wound healing, for reproduction. Now, for me and for metabolism, man, there's two staples to me. Do we have anybody that's interested in food, nutrition, dietetics? Anybody? See, oh, oh, man, I was hoping I was going to get away with it. Oh, okay. Are you kind of, yeah, see, most of my pre-health classes, I can't because we have a lot of food, nutrition, dietetics, or health kind of folks. Because the two most important food groups for me are Pop-Tarts and hamburgers. Okay, that, that's my raw material source right there. Or chocolate cereal, any kind of chocolate cereal. That stuff calls me in the middle of the night. I don't know about you. Does that make sense, metabolism? What we ingest, what we break down, and then recover the energy from that material to use to do all the things that our bodies need to do. That defines life. The other thing, viruses are simply bumping around until they find the correct proteins to attach to on a cell surface. HIV is really nasty because it's got, there's one protein that the HIV virus attaches to, and it's on cells of your immune system. It takes over and it cannibalizes your immune system. But the virus isn't hunting for that. It's just floating around until it attaches to it. Whereas organisms can sense and they can respond to their environment. We have great visual system, which is our chief protective sense. Now, I'm a little country boy. I, I grew up in the country. And I have walked down way too many dirt roads at night. Have you ever been walking in the dark? If you know the dirt road or if you're out in the woods hunting, doing anything like or you're walking down an alley in the city and you hear something big and hairy? You know what I'm talking about? You hear something big and hairy, what's the first thing you do? Now, the first thing I do is run. I'm not that fast, but after I start running, I'm looking. And you turn your attention and you focus your vision, your senses to see what is this about to eat me? Those, those protective responses. So you sense your environment. You respond to that environment. Mine's running. But it's, again, those things that define organisms and those things that define life. Now, your sense and respond, right? Well, we have receptors. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about the special senses a little bit later in class. But you have five special senses. Four of them I would bet you can get, but I'm betting that the fifth one, which is kind of a new one, I'm betting you're not going to get this fifth one. So what are your five special senses? Sight, vision, smell, taste, hearing. Okay, you got the four. Here's the hard one. Touch. Touch used to be considered a special sense. Now, when we say special sense, that means it is a sense whose receptors are localized to a specific place in the body. So touch, you can feel all over. So that's no longer a special sense. Can you think of another one that's pretty important? And you probably get this one jacked up when you have a bad sinus infection and you feel like you're walking on the moon. What is, have you ever felt that way? Feel like a big bobblehead? Balance. Equilibrium is now your fifth special sense that, that we'll talk about. Because if you, if you have an inner ear infection and your balance is off, or has any, anyone had vertigo, a spell of vertigo, or know someone that's had vertigo? Man, a dog that's got vertigo? How tall is this dog? Is it a dots? A Dotson with vertigo. That would be funny. It's like a labradoodle. Yeah, so there's an imbalance between the equilibrium sense in your inner ear and your brain. So that special sense is jacked up. So you have a problem with your balance. So we have receptors that pick up these stimuli. Vision, we're picking up photons of light. Smell, we're picking up chemical senses. And with our hearing, we're picking up sound waves, so mechanical signals. And so when we look at all of these things and all of the receptors, which we get to the nervous system, we're going to talk about a ton of these, including touch, as a generalized sense. 
you know, we're going to be able to detect these with all of these myriad of receptors. Another receptor, a generalized sense. We have the touch. We can sense heat, which I wish I could sense more of that in my house this morning when I got up, but it was cold. So heat, that's going to be receptors that we have in our skin to detect that. Chemical energy. Smell, we said, was a detection of chemical energy. What's your other detection of chemical energy? Very similar to smell. Taste. The taste buds on your tongue detect these soluble chemicals that are dissolved in your saliva. Then we also have mechanical energy, which can be the sound waves, pressure that you might feel, receptors on your skin. All of these are types of stimuli. This is not an all-inclusive list, but many of these stimuli that we have receptors that we can detect in the human body. Now, why is it important for us to have all of these receptors so we can gain all of this information about our environment? We have a ton of receptors that we're going to talk about that gives your brain a ton of information about everything internal to your body, your heart rate, your blood pressure, your fluid volume, your body temperature, your hydration level. All of those receptors are sending information to the brain. So based on what's happening in the environment, what's happening with our body, we can reach a point of balance. And that optimal point of balance for the human body is called homeostasis. Homeostasis, the word literally translated, means to stand equally. Now, when I think of balance, it's not just someone standing still. Have you ever seen those guys that can spin the basketball on their finger? Have you seen those guys that can spin the basketball on both their fingers, on their toes, on these little sticks on their Have you ever seen those guys? That is homeostasis. The balls are balanced, but they have to be spinning, and they have to be spinning quickly. Because your body is continually working to maintain that balance. And so another kind of motto that I think of when I think of homeostasis, homeostasis is dynamic constancy. Go ahead and write that down. Homeostasis is dynamic constancy. Two words that usually don't go together. The dynamic part is your body working so hard to balance itself and stay constant. Your body works really, really hard to keep your body temperature around 98.6. Your body works really, really hard to keep your blood pressure at around 120 over 80. And many, many other aspects of your body, the internal functioning of your body, is a lot of work. That's why you need to provide your body with the right fuel while your body's doing all this activity to maintain homeostasis, and your proper health. Okay, so biology, life. Well, there's a lot of life on the planet. And so since we're talking about human biology in this class, where do we fit into this whole big picture of life and organisms on our planet? So when you look at this illustration and you see this lower level that says domains, we used to have this old classification system, kingdom, phylum, class, order. Did y'all get that in high school? Y'all may be starting to get these domains and stuff in high school by now. But we have these domains, and basically those, these domains are groups that are called eukarya, the EU part of the word means good. Karya or carrion stands for nucleus. So basically these eukaryotic organisms are all organisms that have a membrane bound nucleus and that'll make more sense when we talk about organelles a little bit uh, in a couple of chapters. But that leaves these other groups, the bacteria, and these are our modern bacteria that we know about like E. coli, y'all know about E. coli. 
versus this archaea as a domain, which are the primitive bacteria that were here millions and millions of years ago. They're called extremophiles. They loved really salty conditions or they loved really hot conditions. Well, these two groups don't have a membrane-bound nucleus. And so oftentimes we put these together in a group or domain that we call prokaryotic. Pro meaning before a nucleus. So when we look at humans, we're up here in the animal kingdoms. And so that means we belong in this eukaryotic domain and we're going to be present in the animal kingdom. Now, I like to think, man, animals, we're, we're first, we're the best and all that. Man, plants were really the first branch off of our family tree. Even fungi branched off. It's like we're the latest comers to the game. Now, when we look at our classifications as, as well, we're, we're humans, homo sapiens, but we're primates. Primates, primary. You know what, you know what that means? Pri what does primary mean? First, number one. That's right, we're number one, man. We made the classification, we're number one. Now, if something comes along later, if they're smarter than us, maybe dolphins one day will reclassify. I don't know. But for right now, we're number one. We're primates. So there are a lot of animals in the animal kingdom, but what makes us uniquely human? Well, humans exhibit bipedalism. Bi means two. Ped means foot. So if we're bipedal, that means we walk on two legs. Now, notice I say usually. Have you ever seen a grizzly bear walk on its hind legs? I, I hope on TV, not in person. Have you ever seen a, a silverback gorilla that's like in attack mode. It's walking on its high. They can do that, but normally bears are on all fours and normally gorillas are walking with four legs. So humans usually, for their primary mode of transportation, walking upright. That's typically one of the characteristics of being human. Now, I have two of the most spoiled dogs in the history of the world. They're two little yippy Pomeranians. One's this dumb boy dog who just wants to, he's a big fur ball of play. And the other's this little diva dog. She just wants to sit and be adored. But every now and then that boy dog, he will aggravate me because he won't let me give him his medicine. But I'll finally get him and I'll get that pill down him and I'll look at him and go, Dude, Alex, I'm always going to win because I have opposable thumbs, bud. You just have paws. Opposable thumbs. Man, when, when you look at all of the organisms on the planet, they, they don't have the capacity to really grasp things like we can grab with that thumb. Have you ever injured your thumb and not been able to use it? Man, that sucks. It's almost like hurting your big toe. Just life isn't, you know, your quality of life goes way downhill. But does anyone have a problem with saying opposable thumbs is a human characteristic? Is there any other organisms that got opposable thumbs? Chimpanzees. Chimpanzees have opposable thumbs. And sometimes when you look at the chimps, they will use these sticks or these blades of grass. Have you ever seen them go, going fishing for termites? They will get that blade of grass and they will push it down into the hole of a termite mound and let it sit there for a few minutes and they'll pull it out after the termites have bitten down on And then they'll just, boy, they, it's like candy. They'll just lick it off and put it back down in there. So some of these characteristics, again, while humans exhibit them, they're not in and of a single characteristic, not exclusive to humans. Now, chimpanzees are also primates, so it makes sense that we would share some of our characteristics. But this is where, again, we begin to distinguish humans from other animals and other primates. Humans have among the largest brain mass relative to body size. Now, if you were asked what animal living today has the largest brain, 
what would you have to say? The blue whale, right? Because it's the biggest one. Of course, it's going to have the biggest brain. But its brain mass relative to its body mass is fairly small when we compare to humans and that ratio of brain mass to body. So we have really complex brains. Now, again, I refer to my 18-year-old twin boys who I think share one brain cell. And every now and then I go, does your brother have the brain cell today? Is that why you did that? But we, we don't use a lot of our brain capacity. There's so much untapped potential in the human brain. It's, it's just almost amazing at how intricate the brain can be. Now, distinctly human as well is the capacity for complex language. You know, when I say complex language, complex language to me is English. Uh, there are people that speak tens and twenty languages and can communicate so articulately. You can communicate ideals. You can communicate feelings and emotions. You can communicate abstract concepts. And we can communicate simple facts to one another. But again, this is where we are distinguished in our vocal language, in our written language, and the capacity that we have to communicate across millennia. I mean, we're still learning from the Egyptians as we translate their hieroglyphic language and even earlier cultures that have left written record for us to learn about their cultures. So, complex. So, we walk upright. We have large brains. We have this capacity for language and the communication in the community. Those are some of the aspects that mean we are living. We're composed of one or more cell. We have DNA. We metabolize. We reproduce. And we have all these characteristics of animals and specifically animals that are distinctly human. Now, as we look at the human organism, we're going to generalize here. This is sort of the level in which we as biologists organize. Have you figured out biologists like to categorize things and organize things? It's how we try to make sense of them. It's also ways that we can ask you more things on tests by giving you more information. But we're going to start at the lowest level of organization that we're going to consider, that being the atom. And we're going to see these different levels of biological organization all the way until we get to the entirety of the planet Earth. So the first, the atom. Atom is the smallest unit of an element. And in chapter 2, we're going to talk about different elements and what distinguishes hydrogen from oxygen and carbon and nitrogen, being those subatomic particles, the electrons, protons, and, and neutrons. But if we take elements and we begin to bond them to one another and organize them, then we're going to end up with a structure that's called a molecule. A molecule are two or more atoms that are bonded together. If they're the same, like H2, two atoms of hydrogen bonded together, then we simply call it a molecule. But if there's more than one element involved, we can say that molecule is a compound. H2O. That molecule we can call a compound. Two molecules of hydrogen, I mean two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen. Now, as we assemble all of these molecules and compounds together, we're going to create compartments. And for our purposes as humans, these membrane bound compartments are going to define certain functions. In all of the cells of your body, you have a compartment that holds the DNA. You have another compartment that produces energy. You have another part, compartment that is responsible for producing protein. All these different compartments are referred to as organelles. Now notice something. So far, we haven't gotten to a cell yet. So all of these things, while they contribute to life... They aren't, in fact, themselves living. Because it's only until we package these organelles together into this one singular membrane-bound package called a cell do we then, by our definition in the biological world, 
say we have something that's living. So we've started with atoms, package them together to molecules, see how we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger as we move outward. We make organelles and we take these diverse organelles and we package them together into a living functional cell. Well, let's package some cells together. So if we package cells together, now we are going to get a structure that's called a tissue. Now notice, tissues are a collection of cells that do one thing. So we, we haven't got to the level of the heart yet. We haven't got to the level of the stomach yet. Here, we're just talking about tissues. And we have, there are four different kinds of tissues, and we'll get to in another chapter. You have an epithelial tissue, muscular tissue, nervous tissue, and connective tissue. Those are, those are all four of our tissues. But when you take tissues, different tissues, and you put them together into a singular functioning unit, that's when we have this thing you recognize as an organ. That's where we see the heart, the stomach, the pancreas, the kidneys, comprised of different tissues, but performing one common task. The heart pumps blood. The stomach is the mechanical and chemical digesture of the food that you brought into your body. Now, in our illustration, and the reason I put this asterisk here, I'm going to skip one. And the biological organization I'm going to skip is a collection of organs together performing a function which is a system, an organ system. So your heart with your blood vessels is the circulatory system. Your stomach with your uh, intestines, that's the digestive system. So understand digestive, the systems go where that asterisk is. But I want to take all of the organ systems and I want to put them together into an organism. Now we say multicellular organism. I mean that could be two cells and again that could be 10 trillion cells that we may have in the human body. But this is a living individual consisting of these interdependent cells. They're doing their own thing but they rely on each other to accomplish the task of homeostasis and keeping the organism alive. There's some organs that we can live without. Um, can you think of organs that people lose and they can live without them? Appendix. Okay, appendix. I mean, that's part of your digestive system. Some people think it's involved in uh, your immune system. You can live with like one, of your one of your kidneys. You don't want to try to live without none of them. Yeah. Dialysis for a while. But yeah, you, you've got a spare kidney. What's another one? Gallbladder. Gallbladder. That man, that gives people a lot of time, especially if you have gallstones. Think of any other? You ever heard of your spleen? Spleen is kind of a blood filter. You can live without your spleen because your liver can take over part of the role of doing that. I know uh, several years ago, um, oh, quarterback for the Giants, I forget what his name was, uh, he ruptured his spleen in a football game. He kept passing out because he was bleeding internally. <laughs> Well, they got him to the hospital, removed his spleen, didn't finish the season, um, but uh, he, he had a splenectomy, lived without his spleen. But by and large, all of those cells in our body are important. And if we can hang on to them, let's hang on to them. Unless it's your tonsils and they continually stay infected, then hey, just get rid of those things. So now let's take all of these organisms and let's, let's start to build them on a larger, more global level. So when we take groups of the same species together in a location, we call them a population. So we, we could say that Houston is a population of homeo sapiens. New York is a population of homeostasis. Nacogdoches is a population of homeostasis. You see these different populations separated geographically, those are populations. Now, when we talk about community, now this is where it gets a little bit different. We said 
there was a population of homeo, sta uh, homeo sapiens in Nacogdoches. But if we talk about the community in Nacogdoches, what's the difference? Yeah, the population is one species, but the community is what? All species. All species. We're talking about the dogs. We're talking about the cats. We're talking about the 100 kabillion squirrels on campus. They have fat squirrels, too. You ever notice that? There was a, a raccoon that had gotten caught out here on one of these awnings right before Christmas. I tried putting a ladder up to see if it would climb down the ladder because it was too high to jump. I hope it got down. I hope it's not still up there. But all the species in a location, that's going to be our community. Now we get to the next level. Now we're talking about more than just the living things, more than just the population and more than just the community. When we get to an ecosystem, now we're talking about all of the living species plus the physical environment, the geography of the area. And when, when I think of ecosystem, one, one ecosystem that, I don't know why, but it always comes to mind is a tropical rainforest. So in a tropical rainforest, we're, we're talking about the weather. We're talking about the erosion of the earth. We're talking about the plants and the animals. That entirety is the ecosystem. And then finally... We get to everything on the earth, all the ecosystems on earth, and we refer to that big blue marble in space as the biosphere. All of the living things, all the regions of the earth, that is the biosphere, this great planet on which we live. Hey, here's a chart that's from your textbook. You don't have to learn everything and every word on this chart. If this chart helps you in your studies, if this chart helps you organize these different biological levels and see there's organ system that we threw in there, then use this. But my brain works in a very different way. And I think it's because I'm a guy. Guys, can I go ahead and admit this? Can I? We're lazy. Guys are late. I like to say we work smarter, not harder. Can I get an amen? Yeah. So ladies think we're lazy. No, we just work smarter, not harder. So here, instead of learning all that, I like this right here. Like my pyramid, we're going to start small and go big, right? What's that? Adam. How did you know that? There's only one letter up there. Common sense. Did she just say we don't have common sense? Is, is that what she said? You want to you want to drop the class now or just no? I'm kidding. I kind of need it. What one letter and yet you remembered Adam? You hadn't studied yet, have you? Just one letter. What about that one? How did you know that? That's just one letter. Common sense. You copycat. <laughs> Adam molecule. Organelle. Good one. That is the small compartment that separates the functions within a cell. Now, if we take all the cells, put them together, tissues, organ. Now, here's where the asterisk went. What was the asterisk? Organ system. You can put that in, OS, whatever. Now, this is a little bit tricky. Multicellular organism, common sense, right? No. Oh, you're che you're looking at it. <laughs> Multicellular organism. Now, we're moving away from the individual cells and the pieces to multiple organisms. Population, community, ecosystem, and the big one, biosphere. I, I think part of my job is not just help explain information but try to find helpful ways for you to recall and remember this information other than Google, right? So for me, I like pictures. And I like as little information as possible for me to have to memorize. Because you don't have to memorize all those words, right? They're already rattling around in your head because it's common sense, atoms and cells and tissues. I'm kind of being funny, but I'm not. So if you just memorized 
from the smallest down to the bottom, this pyramid, you just memorize. How many letters are we talking about there? Let, t less than 10? If you do that, you probably already could answer two questions on the next test. Work smarter, not harder. Right? Okay. So periodically, I like to throw these things out there just as suggestions. This may not work for everyone. This is kind of how, how it works for me and how I begin preparing to understand that information and organize it and get ready for the test. Now, a lot of the information that we have about cells, tissues, organelles, was all discovered by scientists in the past. And all scientific discoveries always begin with the same thing. What in the world is that? with an observation, or you have a problem and you have to try to solve the problem. I have no hot water. I mean, this is, you don't just do this in a laboratory with a lab coat on, right? You do this every day of your life, you don't even realize it. But you make an observation and then you go, okay, what is my hypothesis? My pipes are frozen. I have no hot water. It was 500 million degrees below zero last night, or at least it felt like it. My pipes must be frozen. So you formulate that hypothesis, your educated guess, which really, that is what the hypothesis means. Then you predict. I predict if I could follow that length of pipe, I would find the place where there is a chunk of frozen water, some ice inside that pipe. You know what? I'm, I'm going to do that. I am going to take a thermometer. I'm going to take some sort of measuring device. If I could get a metal rod fishing it down the pipe, I would find out where that block of ice would be. And so this ability to predict and design experiments so that you can test what your prediction or hypothesis is this is deductive reasoning. Okay, we, we test our hypothesis. The pipe is frozen. Okay, well, I didn't find anything going this way. Maybe if I go the other way, or maybe if I use a, a different kind of sensor, or maybe I've got to cut the pipe and look inside the pipe. You know, there's a lot of ways you can get at that problem. But you repeat the test, and as you repeat the test, and you interpret the results from the experiment, now you're using inductive reasoning. Well, I bet if it's not this, then it must be this. So you deduce and you induce. And you get to a point that you finally feel comfortable. Yes, my pipes were frozen. I pulled a big, huge chunk of ice out of there. I put the pipe back together. The water's flowing. Oh, did everybody get that? I'll right, back up. So when we use the scientific method daily, we use the scientific method on a specific problem, a specific issue. These are the steps that you typically go through. But the thing that sort of surprised me when I started doing science, when I started doing laboratory science, and for probably the better part of, wow, I really want to admit this, uh, I'm just going to say over 30 years. I have been doing research on how the heart develops, the human heart. I, I am an embryologist, uh, sort of in my research area. Um, I, I teach a medical embryology class, which also means I got to know a lot about cells, I got to know about anatomy, physiology, molecular biology. But your heart started as two little blood vessels in your early embryonic condition where you look like three pancakes. I mean, you were literally three flat pancakes stacked together. And these two little blood vessels were pulled to the middle of your body as these pancakes sort of rolled into a jelly roll. And this one tube fused from those two, and then it started bending and twisting, and parts started getting larger, and parts stayed the same size. And you got these curtains dropping down and going up to divide 
those structures into four chambers, it, it, to me it is absolutely elegant how the heart can form. And did you know when your heart was just that little twisted blood vessel, it started beating? It had to move blood through your embryonic body even before it finished forming. It didn't even really have two chambers and yet it started beating. And to me, I'm like, man, it just blows my mind. But as I'm doing these experiments to look at these molecules and these cells that are involved in this process, every hypothesis I make, every test I run, every paper I write, it leads to 10 more questions. It's, it's like it never ends. So I'm going to kind of skip ahead and then we'll come back, all right? So don't freak out. We'll come back to this one. But this is more what happens. You start in the middle and you just get in this spiral and you just keep going and you just keep going because each time you make a prediction, each time you, you modify or you formulate a whole new hypothesis. I worked at the Arkansas Cancer Research Center for seven years. Uh, I was a gene jockey. I went in and took this receptor on these one, uh, these white blood cells and I would go in and change the DNA, which means I changed the protein. And my advisor predicted, okay, if we delete this segment of this protein, then we're going to lose the activity of this protein. So I did that. Put that gene back in the cell. The cell made the protein. We could see it. Did it have any effect? No, none. We kept deleting these pieces and parts. And every time we would do that and get a different result, it was always like, what in the world is going on? It opened up 10 more questions. So we identified this very narrow five amino acid sequence that if you monkeyed around with that five amino acid sequence, it killed the protein. But we had no explanation why. But it just led, again, to more and more questions. So as you do this, this is where we're getting the inductive reasoning versus the deductive reasoning. With deductive, you start with a theory and you do predictions and experiments that kind of guide you toward that theory. Inductive reasoning, you start with observations, and you have these generalizations and ideas that lead you to this idea or this theory, but you see how this could be just a big circle? So the deductive and inductive reasoning is what really guides our advancement. Now listen, this is the scientific method, but you can apply this to business practices. You can apply this in a very loose way to relationships with people or various other situations and circumstances you find yourself in. This is not restricted to working with DNA in, in a laboratory. But does that make sense? So by using the scientific method, by using what you see and know, the deductive part, using what you believe, what you feel, your experiences to predict the inductive part, we can solve problems. 